Welcome to Indy Capital. I'm Pamela Nash, and this is Ellie Walton. We're going to be talking about some of her recent projects, including Voices from Within and Walk With Me. Ellie, Voices from Within, pretty scary. <laughs> well, actually, I think that's something that we're trying to address through the film. I think mm -hmm. that um, we're going to a place that most people never go, which is inside a, a mental hospital. And I think we're trying to break that, that stigma and fear about what actually happens inside a mental hospital. And more importantly, about the personal stories. Um, so looking at, at some individuals in care who have been there for decades and actually giving them the cameras and giving them the opportunity to share how they got there, what life has been like there, and what their dreams are in, um, in their recovery. So I think it can seem scary, like going to St. Elizabeth's Hospital, this place you know, down across the river that most people have only heard about through stories of like John Hinckley. And um, yet you go inside and you meet these, um, these men and, and you actually connect with them and realize that, you know, they fall in love, they, they have dreams, they get angry just like you do. And actually, you know, we're much more connected to these people than what you might have imagined not knowing anything about it. You've got these gentlemen that were very young, actually, many decades ago that are placed into St. Elizabeth's because of a crime. Mm -hmm. And more than that many years of life later, you know, you've got someone who goes in at 27 and now he's 60 and he spent most of his life. And is he the same person that, that was placed in to St. Elizabeth's? Not at all. And, and for a lot of different reasons, but I think, um, I mean, when, when they went into St. Elizabeth's, they were not well. Um, uh, some of them had just come back from the Korean War. Um, some of them were struggling with a lot of mental illness that had been gone. Like they were struggling with it and in a situation, um, whether they were homeless or whether they were dealing with um, intense poverty. And I think that um, this led them to commit crimes, which led them to the hospital. 20 years, 30 years later, They've been going through intensive kind of recovery programs. Um, and I think so something that they wanted to express through their films is actually how much they have changed and how they are not the same the same people they were when they came in there. And I think you really you really believe them. Um, but something the film also looks into, which is like, well, what's that next step? Like, there's a sense of, in some ways, that they're in this black hole, um, that they can only get out when some judge says that, that they're better. And, um, and what does that mean? And really, for these men who have been institutionalized for decades, how can you actually feel like you're better until you're actually allowed to be a full person again. And a lot of that is, is actually being out in the community and being able to be seen as a human being. And I think it's hard to really feel that when you've been in a hospital for so long. So their change, and some of it is like they're recovering, and some of it is actually their change and they're, they're still trying to figure out the ways in which they can be human again. Um, and I think that's something that was powerful and what they shared through the video diaries is that like when they're given the tools to really share and have the power over sharing their story, then um, it's kind of incredible how they can make those connections again. And they talked again and again about how they felt like they, they, they were, like they could connect and they were excited about getting out of the hospital and they felt like they could leave and be part of the community again. So as a filmmaker, what kind of, or was there any type of research or, or training or anything that you had to go through in order to access these particular people? Um, well, my sister, Joy, who um, is a co-director and co-producer on the film, she um, reached out to Maureen Jaysmick, who is the volunteer coordinator at St. Elizabeth's. And it was actually through their connection, and it took around four or five months for us to get the permissions to go inside the hospital to work with these men. Um, and it was the first time that this was actually allowed, where we were cameras could go in and actually have been put ex like into the hands of the people who have been there. So it definitely was a, a process. Um, and I think particularly, particularly because we were coming in saying, you know, we want to make a film with these men. Like we, it's not, St. Elizabeth gets like every week they get 
offers from documentary filmmakers about coming in to do something about John Hinckley, and they always turn them down. But I think our philosophy as filmmakers is very much a collaborative approach to filmmaking, which is very different, and that is, and the difference is in the power balance. Like we're we're sharing that power, and we're kind of giving platforms to to folks to actually tell their own stories. And I um, I think the new CEO of the hospital is really excited about using art as therapy, and so this was kind of part of that program. So these aren't subjects in the classical sense that we would think of a subject. They're actually co-creators. Yeah, the they're participants. They are creating their stories. And I think that's why that's why I think it's such a powerful piece because it's very unfiltered. Like you're sitting them, they're sitting with them in their room and it's them and the camera and they're talking to you. There's like we're not there, they're deciding what to say. Um, they're deciding how they want to be represented. And I think after years of being like observed by other people and broken down into categories and diagnoses and crimes and labels, I think it's just a, a completely new thing for them to actually decide how they want to be viewed and for them to like kind of put a mirror in front of themselves and reflect on their life um, and where they want to go. Um, so I think they, they, they actually, even though they themselves were scared coming into the project, um, I saw them last night actually and it was, um, they, they shared again to me like how it's given them this newfound confidence to, to really start thinking about where they want to be and go in the future. And we're going to take a look at the trailer from Voices from Within. This is little old Lou Ecker. And I want to say that this video diary is a very new and sometimes very difficult thing to do. It's the first time I think in the history of St. Elizabeth's Hospital they've allowed cameras in and patients to be photographed. But they did and we signed up and we're doing it. Everything is going to be shot by you guys. So we're basically here to facilitate it and just to help you. I think it's really important to give microphones to people and to share those skills so that people can tell their own stories. And my lawyer told me, you'll be here for 90 days observation. And 90 days turned out to be 23 years. So it's been um, a surprise to me. It's been 23 years. And like everybody says, it's time for me to get out. Everybody's working with me, the patients, the staff, the counselors, the psychologists, the doctors, all of them are trying to work with me to get out of here. And I appreciate that. I'm doing something. And Lord knows, I hope it breaks down all that stigma about mental illness. I'm uh, major depression, schizoaffective, bipolar disorder, schizophrenic paranoia, and borderline personality. And let's talk about your 
project Walk With Me. It's a film about women who use theater. <laughs> so were there any convention disconnects between film and theater? What do you mean? Well, <laughs> film gets a lot of takes. Theater yeah. does not. Theater, once the ball gets rolling, you've got to go because you're on stage. Mm. So was there any kind of like stop, do it over, like frustrations or, or any kind of disconnects? between the, is it right to say subjects, the subjects of the documentary? Or? Yeah, you can say that. I mean, yeah. I choose participants. The participants, not, yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, like while I was filming? Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Um, I, I think that the reason I chose to do this film was because of what you just said, like the power of theater because it's live and there's something incredible about like being in that moment and you're improvising and you're trusting your instinct and you are just going for it. Um, and I think a lot of transformation can happen in that when you have that trust in yourself. Um, I think again my style of, of filmmaking is very much that. It's like trusting my impulse and hanging out with the people who I'm filming with. Um, and so it's not a lot of like, wait, stop, you didn't do that, right, let's do it again. You know, it's like going with things, you know, really, you know, being okay with my voice coming coming in and being okay with me being sometimes on camera. Like I think be, I like being transparent and going with and revealing my relationship with the people that I'm filming. Um, I think particularly with Walk With Me, um, the, the it is inspired by my own godmother who passed away eight years ago and she was a force in this town and she's the reason I do the work I do now. I mean she you know took me in with five other teenage girls from DC in her basement studio and every other Saturday we played. We had that energy that you were talking about that just like let's just imp improvise a scene, let's like write a poem, let's just trust that you know that thing inside us that we can't describe but it's like this creative spirit that we all are born with and we all have the right to express and we need to in order to be our full selves and I think like being blessed with that opportunity to be in a space like that with my godmother is why I'm, I'm doing the work I'm doing and so when she passed away um, it just left such a like poof <laughs> and a lot of folks in this town because she inspired a whole community of, of not just theater artists but filmmakers and artists and poets um, and so that's why this film is a tribute to her and to, to that spirit so I felt like if I'm going to make a film about her I also have to, to do it in the way that she would want me to do it and have that, that, that spirit of, of play and that spirit and that passion of, of creating change through art Tell me about some of the work that your participants in this film are doing. Yeah, so the first one is my godmother, Rebecca Rice, and she um, she grew up in Chicago and came to came to DC right when the like the MLK riots had just happened, and she was part of this incredible um, company called Living Stage, which was actually a branch of Arena Stage, and they took theater into prisons and safe houses and schools. Um, like off of the stage and actually used it as this tool to engage with communities, to underserve communities as a, as a way for them to, to get kind of discover their, their full potential. Um, so there's clips of her in these prisons, in Lorton Prison and a women's prison, and you can see, you know, how she um, and Living Stage as a company is able to just really get into some incredible like places of talking about like alcohol or abuse or talking about domestic violence or talking about their dreams. Um, and it's really like these, this incredible archive footage of that. And then we fast forward and we have another piece that she's doing in, uh, with Arena Stage called the Southwest Project which was about a community that was um, kicked out of their neighborhood because of a, a kind of the first um, urban renewal project. And she uses um, theater as a way of kind of uncovering the, that story, which you know a lot of us haven't been talking about, where Arena Stage is right now. And then, so she's the first woman, and then she passes it on to Lisa, who um, is from Chicago, and she does a, re I mean, she's a, a dancer and performer, and she explores um, the kind of, looks at, uh, like, 
an abolitionist and looks at slavery and looks at, again, similar to Voices from Within, things that aren't necessarily we like to talk about. And she does it in this way by really use, like throwing her body to um, in this beautiful form that we have to look at it and then kind of question where we are now in terms of um, our kind of inequalities and, and, and things. And then we get to Anu, <laughs> and she is just taking theater back to the young people and really recognizing, you know, she goes to a, a community in Anacostia and creates a play with, uh, with some young people and teenagers there. Um, and again, gets back to that kind of core that um, Rebecca was doing with Living Stage, which is like, this is what happens when you give young people these tools to really express themselves. And, and these are young folks who are dealing with a lot. And I think it's a way that they can really communicate what's on their mind and then, and then imagine, imagine a, a different way of being, imagine the possibilities that they can have in their life. When you have a really deeply personal connection with one of the three participants in your work, how do you balance the final work so that nobody feels like, oh, it was really about her and we were just not the relatives or not the, you know, the, how, how do you give the, the, the balanced time to each story? Yeah, I mean, in some ways you, you just got to be honest that, you know, this was inspired by Rebecca, so... Um, the work starts from her and then is passed on to Lisa and then Anu. And so actually we are going to hang out a bit a bit more with, with Rebecca. I think as a filmmaker, you got to sometimes just go and, and create that base of the story and then build from there. Um, but I, I think that it doesn't necessarily mean that, that Lisa's story and Anu's story is of less value. And I think they really build from each other. So Rebecca creates this base and then we, we continue building with Lisa and then Anu. Um, and so it doesn't feel necessarily like distinct story, stories. It's actually one, that it's like one body of work that is continuing. And I think that's why we chose to bring in two other women, is because we felt like it was important to recognize that although Rebecca passed away, like this work is, is continuing on, um, and, this, and it's really important. And also, I'm actually, Lisa is a dear friend of mine and also was uh, one of Rebecca's uh, mentees. And Anu, as well, is another dear friend of mine. So, so those relationships are still, still there and you can still feel it in the film. And we have the trailer for Walk With Me. Art saves lives. Yes, it does. And I have to begin with my own self. The poem or an art piece or a song can be a way of expressing that same sense of desiring to be heard or frustration or rage or anger or love that picking up a gun and shooting somebody might. Like. I want something so much more. I want you to help us by putting this in the art. Oh, you're not coming with me? We're gonna pretend like nobody's holding the camera? Everybody! You can pick up the sword or you can pick up the pen. You can get pick up a gun or you can become an artist. Theater people, we're beginning. Looking at your work um, from a local perspective, you really love DC. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that is really obvious. Even just hearing you talk about the, the people you've worked with, everything is, is local to D.C. Tell us a little bit about why there's so much here. Yeah. Um, I was born and raised here. I mean, D.C. raised me. I grew up in Mount Pleasant. Um, and I think 
growing up, I was always really frustrated about how DC um, was represented in the media. Um, I felt like it was either seen as just the place where these politicians hung out, or it was seen as the murder capital. Um, and I think um, growing up with that, I wanted to, to kind of illustrate the, the beauty um, that exists in this town and, and the history of, of music and art and film and theater. Um, I feel like it's really vibrant here. Um, and so when I came back to DC after being away um, at school, um, I really wanted to, to work with communities here um, and create stories with them to kind of illustrate, again, that, that beauty that's here. And I think particularly because um, DC, there's a pocket of DC that's very transient. Um, so I think it's really important to, to illustrate, again, that the history and the beauty that gets passed down through generations here and, and kind of document that. Um, so my first film was about a community that was, that was kicked out, that lived two blocks from the Capitol. Um, so I focused it on, on their story because I felt like it was, it was something that needed to be heard. Um, both because I think, you know, gentrification um, is something that we need to be talking about in this town, but also because their, the strength of their voices and the strength that, um, of the community that they created, I felt like was important to highlight and lift up. Um, and I think film has that capacity to do that. Like when you partner with folks, you can, you can illustrate what the power that they have. Um, I don't like the, the phrase, give voice to voiceless, because I feel like people have their own voices. I don't even like the phrase, empower. I think they have their own power. And I think, you know, with Chocolate City, I was just illustrating the power that this community had and actually the brilliance. And they know what they want, you know, for their community. They want jobs. They want new places to live. They do, they know what they want, and they're the experts of that so coming back to DC I just really wanted to illustrate you know folks who are in this town who have ideas for how this town should be could be you know in their dreams for it you you find a way to identify people who have something to say and help them say it and then you you just wrapped with some younger people who their story is not told yet hmm. their story could go any way and anywhere and tell us a little bit about what their experience was and, and, and what, what basically, what roads are open to them. Yeah, it was probably the hardest and most exciting shoot I've ever been on in my entire life. Um, we took 15 teenagers from, from DC um, and we went to the mountains of West Virginia and they were given so much support and love and opportunities to to write and to perform and to talk about you know the, what they've been through in their lives which is a lot um, and I think what came out actually was just the incredible amount of, of of violence that you know a lot of our young people are experiencing in, in neighborhoods in DC but not just in DC like all around the world and I think that um, particularly with, with teenagers and with young folks, I think people often speak on, on behalf of them. Um, and often they are not, they are not seen um, or given the opportunity to, to be their full selves. And I think when you take them out of their environment and, and put them into the mountains and there are these powerful mentors um, kind of encouraging them and supporting them, um, it was beautiful, and I've never seen, I think like the ideal for, you know, as a documentary filmmaker, you can't script it, but um, you want to see change. You want to see something happening in the moment. Um, and I think what was amazing about this shoot is you saw things change. Like you saw this guy who had never cried, um, whose father had been in prison for most of his life. Um, who has, you know, doesn't have a very good relationship with his mom, you know, who's just been through a lot. And then he see this moment where he's opening up to, to his mentor and he's just streaming with tears. And um, just like those changes like that and being able to capture that and, and illustrate that actually these young people have a lot to say and they're articulate and they know what they want and they want something different. 
um, the same the same young man um, expressed that you know nobody ever actually asked or believed that he could be anything um, like nobody at his school nobody in his community and um, I think that you know they have there's a lot of shells that get that get created um, when you're growing up and I know growing up in DC like witnessing like the riots in my neighborhood or witnessing things in my neighborhood you can feel yourself like kind of it's like a protection um, and I think it's important to, to knock them down and I think that's what um, I witnessed in in West Virginia was just like seeing these kids knock down these walls and um, and really produce some really beautiful pieces of art, but also just really like rise to the occasion and kind of, they revolted at one point, <laughs> actually. <laughs> They're like, we're taking control. You want us to be leaders? Okay, we're going to redo the whole camp. And they did. And it was, it, was, it was incredible. So how do you kind of send them back safely? Now they're vulnerable, now they're exposed, and they have to leave the mountains at some point and go back to the city. Yeah, yeah, well, I think um, that was a really good point, and it was brought up. One of the, one of the young men, he said, you know, this is, um, this is eight days, and you can't grow a tree in eight days. And then one of the main facilitators, she said, but you could plant a seed in one minute. Um, I know, which sent, like, chills yeah. through me. I was, like, filming, like, ooh. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but um, I think they... One Common Unity is the organization which um, was the one who was leading this group of young people and they've been doing peace education for 10 years in the city. So I think they are continuing to meet with these young people every other Sunday because they recognize that you can't just you know, parachute in and take these young people out and then be like, okay, we're done. Um, so it's going to be, it's a six month long program that actually builds to December. And then after that, we'll continue through um, another mentorship program. So I think they recognize that change takes time and you got you to gotta keep connected. And in order for it to be sustainable, you got to make sure that you're, you're, you're guiding these tools that you've given to these young people and you know, making sure that they have the support to use those back here. And, you know, it's been a challenge for them in some ways. And also, they've been totally rising to, to the occasion. We're going to have a look at the trailer from Fly By Light. It feels kind of good to wake up in the wilderness without having to worry. Because still, like, I'm the kind of person who is fear. Like, I fear things, like a lot of things. And, like, most of the times, if I'm getting bullied or anything, I keep my fears bottled up inside. And I know I came, that's why I came here, to like, change. It's called Fly By Life. Have you ever been trapping? You ever, you like the nature, you like nature, you like being out? What's your name, brother? Mark? Cool, man. I'm Hawa. We're doing this retreat into West Virginia. We're taking students and young people from D.C. for an eight-day, all-expenses-paid kind of vacation, you could say. There's going to be drumming. There's going to be music, therapy. So basically hearing about the issues that you deal with growing up in the city, like what are the biggest things that you got to face, the hardest obstacles that you have, what are your goals, and what do you find important in life? I love the talent, you know. They sing, they dance, they write, they speak, they draw, they paint, anything, whatever it is. Like, if we could get all of them together and just like show the adults that we have this, like, you don't always have to tell us that we can't do something, because we can and we will. For Indie Capital, I'm Pamela Nash, and this has been Ellie Walton.